You are listening to Love in Movement, a podcast where we share our unique expressions of living love in our daily life, inspired by messages in the book, A Course of Love. Welcome everyone to our Course of Love podcast show. I am Lynn Kidd. I'm your host today. And today we're going to be looking at some passages in chapter 20, Wholeheartedness, the Embrace. And we're going to be reading some of those. And the invitation is for us to experience the feeling of the words and the essence of it as it's coming through. And I'm going to let Evelyn say a little more about that. So let me introduce our guest, Evelyn Sorrentino. She's joining us from Kittery, Maine. So welcome again, Evelyn. And um, I'm going to let you take it away for now. All right. Thanks, Lynn. As always, it's it's just a great uh, pleasure to be with you interacting, um, whether we haven't interacted in person yet, but I know it's going to be nice when we do, but also to do it remotely. And uh, the reason I selected this passage to read is because it's a wonderful demonstration of various metaphors that uh, Marie uses when she's doing a course of love. The metaphors are there to help stimulate our imagination, but they're also there to help stimulate our sense of the relationship. Not necessarily the relationship of the words on the page or the metaphors that she has placed on the page, but to be able to feel that relationship with our divine. And so that's why I selected these passages so that we can focus on what actually comes through in the silent communication with God when we read. And also to be able to step back and take a look at the big picture. Because when we read The Course of Love, there's not just the details on the page, but it's also, again, to use a metaphor, it's the proverbial to see the forest through the trees. So each chapter, the words on the page are the trees, but we must be able to step back to see the forest. The forest is an analogy of our relationship with the divine and how to enter into a new way of learning and understanding. It's important every time we open up a page for the first time of the day on A Course of Love to make sure that we're centered, that our mind is absolutely quiet so that when we do read, we're not thinking about what happened a half hour ago or we're not planning subconsciously what's going to happen when I'm done with my reading. I believe that when we're relaxed when we're reading, that's when our mind is open and we can hear the spirit speak to us. If we feel rushed in any way by reading as an obligation, we don't hear that communication. We don't hear that one relationship speaking to us in our feeling senses. So it's really important to be slow. And if we're not slow, just slow ourselves down by reading even slower. So with that, Lynn, I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind, to begin reading 20 Point one five. Okay, paragraph 15 in chapter 20, The Embrace. Imagine a body in a cave. A cave in the earth. The earth and the planet. The planet in the universe. Each cradles the other. None are passive. None are dead. All share the heartbeat of the world and are at rest within each other. within each other's embrace and the embrace of God's love, God's creation, God's heartbeat. God's heartbeat 
is the source of the world, capital S. The soul of the world, capital S. The sound, capital S, of the world in harmony. Existence with no beginning and no end. One embrace, all in all, none lesser and none greater, for all is all. One is one. So, Lynn, thank you for that beautiful reading. The tempo that you set in that reading helped me to feel that oneness just from the very first trail to see the body connected to the heartbeat of God and to shift my understandings of Earth, which was a name for the planet that we live on to now represent just soil and rock. And to feel the living heartbeat within me as you were reading, connecting the two of us. So if you were reading this in one of the groups that I lead, we would take pause for meditation here because these words absolutely lead us to the understanding that there is no separation in anything that we experience. That we are all equal. So there is no judgment. And you take me back to a time when I was a child and my parents would read fairy tales to me. And I would think they were fairy tales and then my parents would show me how, no, this is a lesson in life. Like the fairy tale of Puss in Boots. Thinking it's just a story of a cat dressing up, but realizing it's learning all about love and kindness and compassion. So as you were reading this with my eyes closed, listening to you, I could go back to that time and I could also feel the oneness of this paragraph. And because it's a podcast, we won't take the time to meditate, but this is a great way to read the book to read it slowly. And when we find something that moves us to stay with that movement or go deeper until the movement enters into the stillness and then listen in that stillness. And sometimes we can just read a paragraph for our daily practice and let this paragraph carry us throughout the day. As I go throughout my day, I'm going to always think all in all, none lesser, none greater. It brings all of my judgments to the surface so that there is no difference between me and another. And I'm just feeling the love of God surrounding me. And as the next paragraph states, there is no longer cause for alienation nor feel the feeling of abandonment that so many of us have felt. We are now within the embrace where all such hurts are healed. Another opportunity to pause 
And if we're in this stillness now, any place where I have felt abandonment in my past or left out, excluded in any way, my internal teacher now brings it to me. And right now, as we convene for this reading, I am seeing a time where I thought there was alienation between my older sister and myself. When I no longer chose her to be my leader, but I began relying on my inner guide. And right here in this moment, I understand. That she did not leave me, but it was God saying, continue to lean on me, Evelyn. It was a door closing so the new door could open and stay open and I could stay across the threshold. And so now, Lynn, I ask you, if you have any impartations from these two paragraphs that we have read together. Yeah, I really love the first one that we read. And um, I could feel its beauty in my own heart as I was reading it. And I could feel the connection here between us and the connection with everything. It was very comforting to read it. I could feel the comforting energy around me as well to just know that being within God's embrace, the loves or love's embrace, always connected to that and just taking the time to go slow, pause, and be still, and to feel that connection, the one heartbeat that sustains all of us. And so there's many times in my life as well where I've felt lonely and abandoned, and I've taken that time to pause. Or as, of course, the miracle says, there's a workbook lesson I've been looking at recently 156, I walk with God in perfect holiness. And I actually just did it yesterday. <laughs> and the last part of that, it says, you know, there's a question that comes through and it says, who walks with you? Mm -hmm. Ask this question a thousand times a day until mm -hmm. certainty is established. And the way is made clear. And that's, it was coming up when I was reading this too, who walks with me? And just to know that, yeah, to feel that connection. When I'm there, yeah, there's peace and everything is okay. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, Lynn, you know that one line that you said, that for me has been more than the lesson itself. Who walks with me? And anytime my feet move, whether I'm in the busy city streets walking, or if I'm taking a hike or a stroll along the ocean with anyone, I do ask that question I, a thousand times. I ask that question when I'm a passenger in a car even, who sits with me now? So that helps me to stay completely out of judgment. The judgment being that this is a person here that this is a body, and I then can focus on their inner Christ. And the connection is just so beautiful. And many times when it's with people that I've walked with that I know, they'll say to me at the end of the walk, wow, this has been one of the best walks I've had in a long time. And I can't explain why. And of course, I don't have to say anything either. But I love that line, yeah, who walks with me?
Would you like to read the next paragraph, Lynn, 20.17? Sure. Paragraph 17. The world does not exist apart from you. And so you must realize your compassionate connection. The world is not a collection of cement buildings and paved streets, nor of cold, heartless people who would as soon do you harm as good. It is but the place of your interaction with all that lives within you, sharing the one heartbeat. The heartbeat of the world does not exist apart from God. The heartbeat of the world is thus alive and part of you. This heart connection is what we seek to return you to. This heart connection is what we seek to return you to. This realization that the world is not a thing and you are not a thing. Your identity is shared and one in Christ. Your identity is shared and one in Christ. A shared identity is a quality of oneness. A shared identity is one identity. When you identify with Christ, you identify with the one identity. When you realize the oneness of your identity, you will be one with Christ. Christ is synonymous with oneness. Yeah. So is it the words on the page that I was listening to? Or is it your intention to be one with Christ, with my intention? But as you were reading, I could see Jesus in the synagogue when he was reading the Torah. And the Pharisees commented and said, is this not the carpenter's son? And yet he reads the Torah so perfectly. This is the new way of learning. This is the forest now that we are seeing in the midst of this tree of this paragraph. The Torah was written so that the vowels of words were deliberately omitted. Part of that was also to not totally write the name of God, having two vowels. So in order to read the Torah, one must have had studied it day in and day out. 
in the schools that the wealthy children could go to. So Jesus was this poor carpenter's son. How would he know this? That's why they were all astounded. And yet he demonstrates this paragraph. The new way of learning is not through rote and the educational process with a hierarchy of education, but it's our oneness. Jesus was so connected to, to use the words of the New Testament, so connected to the Father. His knowingness could lead him through each and every word that he read from the Torah. He didn't have to have studied it and memorized it. It was the knowing that was imparted to him. This is the way of our learning with a course of love and with all parts of life. To listen in between the words, to feel that connection to the divine, the omniscience, to know what is ours to know in the moment of knowing it. To never lose that connection. Or if we do lose it in our awareness, the moment we become aware of that loss, to simply reconnect through the stillness. So this is another one of those paragraphs that's just wonderful to help us see the forest through the trees. It's all about the knowingness that comes when we are tapped into that awareness of God's presence all around us. And as the next paragraph states, who could be left out of this embrace? And who from within the embrace could be separate and alone. So we're all there. Okay, paragraph 31. This cooperation is natural. When fear has been rejected. You have long embraced fear and rejected love. Now the reverse is true. This reversal of truth has changed the nature of your universe. and the laws by which it operates. The laws of fear were laws of struggle, limits, danger, and competitiveness. The laws of love are laws of peace, abundance, safety, and cooperation. The laws of love are laws of peace, abundance, safety, and cooperation. Your actions and the results of your actions in a universe of love will naturally be different from your actions and the results of your actions in a universe of fear. You set the laws of the universe 
when you choose fear. The laws of the universe of love are God given. So one of the things that we can certainly feel as a result of your reading of this paragraph is the utmost importance of cooperation, right? Our cooperation with the divine. We can feel the resistance when we choose the laws of fear. But when we cooperate with the divine, it's not laws of love we feel, we feel the love. And everything just flows through us. Like when I first got married, I remember there were rules that I thought we should abide by. <laughs> and those rules were broken every single day <laughs> until I finally got it. It's like, oh, these are my rules. These are rules based on fear. Fear that there's not enough love from my husband for me. Fear that if he does things in a way that I don't like them, they're not going to be done right. Fears that there's not a better way. And when I started to let go of all that, simply by letting him be who he wanted to be and do what he wanted to do, how he wanted to do it, even projects that we worked on together cooperatively, it meant when he was insistent upon a certain way of getting a project done, for me to tap into that cooperative place of the divine, and then we would come up with a solution that would be a third or a fourth way of seeing it that would be far better than I had originally in mind and that he even thought of. We put aside the laws of fear, which is my way, your way, to God's way. And to this day, anytime we're making a decision, we say thy will, not mine. And we both have to be in total agreement before we move ahead. If he wants a black floor and I want a white floor, we wait until we find the perfect floor and we both say, hey, this will work. I mean, that's just a rudimentary example, but each and every day, right, people in our family lives, people in our great close friendships, we're making decisions. And when we find that we're insisting on our way, we're operating under the laws of fear. But when we throttle back, feel the connection to the divine and recognize God is not only omniscient, he's omnipotent. There's only God power. And the right way will always be shown. And there's only this one relationship. The one relationship is the feeling of the love and the peace. That's how I know I'm in relationship. I feel the peace. If I feel resistance, I'm not in relationship. So it's easy to surrender that resistance. Everything else falls into fear, rejecting love. If I'm in my head, I can't feel that resistance. I'm into pride. I feel I'm right. I say I'm feeling right, but it's really I'm thinking that I'm right. I'm judging my own stuff as being superior to another. Or many times we can find the reverse is true in some people. I'm judging my stuff as inferior, and therefore I don't speak up. I don't express myself fully. And when I stifle my true expression of my spirit, anger starts to form. And then it just keeps me further separated from God. And I blame the other person for being dominant or um, pushy, more educated than I am. Other different values that I 
call superior. But when I'm in this place of peace, there is no superior, there is no inferior. So these are the laws of love right here, where all are equal. There's no fear of being less than. There's no competition to be greater than. We all are equal. And for you, Lynn, what does this bring up? Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I love that last line, the laws of the universe are, are love, which are God-given. And that's to me, is the only truth that, that I want to say, the only truth that really works because all else is just projections of a, a separate self. Recently with a friend of mine, I was having an issue with our friendship we started to argue and um, it was making things very difficult in our relationship. So one day I made a decision to let down my defenses and just to come open, no resistance, and to truly listen to what my friend was saying and to give it all over to God. That's it. I just I stepped back and let him lead the way. And the fact that I let down my defenses and I was willing to truly listen, our whole relationship just shifted on a dime. I feel that that is what brought in a holy relationship. And it was so instantaneous. It was, it was definitely the holy instant. And it's been good ever since. Nothing has come up between us. We honor each other. We listen and we've learned to be open to what the other one is saying. And it's made all the difference in the world. But going back to this, the laws of the universe of love are God given. To me, that's the, as you said, it's win win for both sides. Nobody is left out. It brings everything together into a harmony. That's the word I was looking for. It's a harmony when I'm able to align myself in this holy instant with my brother. So yeah, it does work. <laughs> That's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Yeah, Lynn, you mentioned the word truth, but there's only one truth. Sometimes people say, well, that's true for you, but it's not true for me. Well, if that's the case, it's not truth. Truth is one of those things that's absolute. We all feel it. We all know it. Mm -hmm. We all recognize it. It looks the same to all of us. It's that peace and love within us. It's something that's universal. It cannot be subjective. There is just one truth. The truth is that we put down any thing that disrupts our harmony. And when we're in that place of harmony, to use your words, we're in the truth. We're feeling our connection to the divine. And through that, we're connected to all. We know the oneness. Everything else points to separateness, differences, differences of opinions, differences of thoughts. But the truth is sameness, oneness. There's no variation. Yeah, the, the truth unites. That was the phrase that was coming in for me. The truth unites. I like that too. The truth is always true. It's not just true some of the time. <laughs> it's, true. it's true all the time. I think actually that's, of course, a miracle. The truth is always true. It can be generalized to everything. I would just say, <laughs> try it out and see, experience with it, you know, and see how it works because it, it does work. It's never not worked. <laughs> it's me that puts up the barriers to the blocks. When you were in disharmony with your friend, you felt it. It was not in your head. You didn't logic it away. You didn't rationalize it, saying I was right. You could actually feel the discomfort in your body. This is what I say is the most important thing in the course of love, to be able to feel 
it's not talking about emotion it's talking about using the body as the communication device so god lets us know when we're separating ourselves by sensations by holding on to disharmony in whatever form that takes whether it's a very mild frustration or very strong resentment and anger an urge to kill we have to feel each day that we read we also need to spend each day in trying to learn our new education of feeling sensations because unless we feel in the body our mind will run the show and always lead us back to that circuitous route that takes us outside and disguises the path like the yellow brick road that leads to nowhere so we must feel in order to do that am i not right did you not feel uncomfortable when you had this argument with your friend oh for sure it was definitely in my body my whole body felt constricted it was also like a very um sort of a cold sensation as well cold yeah. and uh constricted i mean i love that you brought it up the feelings in the body i think there's a line in a course of love it might be in day eight but it says something of like the feelings are in your body and your body is now a helpmate. It uses that phrase. I love that. A helpmate in your service as a route to true expression. I love that. And then I also wanted to just mention something too, that you, when you said the body is a communication device. Yeah, that is, there's a whole section in the text and the courts and miracles where it speaks to that as well. The author of the book may sometimes use the word feelings interchangeably with emotions and then body sensations. So one has to read that in the context of the paragraph in which the word feelings is used. But right in the introduction, she says, this course was written to move the mind to appeal to the heart, to move it to accept confusion, to cease resistance. That in itself is saying, how do we recognize resistance unless we feel it? So right in the introduction, and if we read throughout the book and we don't start practicing understanding our body sensations, that is the mind at work obfuscating the most essential element of this course. And when we finish day 40, in the very last part of the book, we're going to be reading the book all over again, trying to understand what this was trying to tell us. So we must feel, feel to heal, I like to say, feel to heal. Yeah. That's great. Feel to heal. Yeah. Feel to heal. That's it. It seems like that's it. It comes down to feeling. Yeah. <laughs> feel to heal. Yeah. Feel to heal. Yeah. Did you have any last minute insights, Evelyn, that you wanted to share before we close? No, I think that last sentence feel the heel says it all yeah okay all right well thank you thank you evelyn for joining and and thanks to all of our audience out there those who are listening we, we hope we've given you a very experiential way of listening to these words and hope you'll take this uh experiential practice as you read a course of love and of course in miracles so peace, love, grace, and blessings to everyone. And we will see you next time on either a podcast or a video. But thank you. Thanks, Lynn, for hosting this. I appreciate it. You're very welcome.